Politicians lie. We all know that. This is not an indictment of all politicians. It's simply part of the game. It's our job as informed citizens to figure out the truth. And that's where journalists and the media come in. They are supposed to help us ferret out fact from fiction. So when they get a fact wrong, that's bad. When they get a fact wrong, know it's wrong, and don't correct it, that's worse. That's not getting a fact wrong. That's a lie. And that's journalistic malfeasance. The best, or maybe worst, example of this followed a presidential press conference at Trump Tower on Tuesday, August 15th, 2017. You remember what happened that previous weekend. A group of white supremacists held a white pride rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. The ostensible reason was to protest the removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. An Antifa group showed up to counter protest. The mayor and the police were totally unprepared to deal with the violence that ensued. Tragically, a young woman, Heather Heyer, was run over and killed by a neo-Nazi. The press conference itself was raucous. The media was antagonistic. The president was combative. Out of it all, one phrase eclipsed the thousands of words exchanged. The media reported that President Trump described neo-Nazis as very fine people. Only he didn't. In fact, he didn't even hint at it. Just the opposite. He condemned the neo-Nazis in no uncertain terms. So then, who were the fine people he mentioned? The answer? He was referring to another group of Charlottesville demonstrators who came out that weekend. Protesters who wanted the Robert E. Lee statue removed and protesters who wanted to keep the statue and restore the park's original name. This is what President Trump said about those peaceful protesters. You also had some very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. A few moments later, in case there would be any misunderstanding, he makes his meaning even more explicit. I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists. They should be condemned totally. Lest you have any doubts that good people were in Charlottesville to protest the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue, the New York Times confirmed it in a story they published the next day, August 16th. Good people can go to Charlottesville, said Michelle Percy, a night shift worker at a Wichita, Kansas retirement home who drove all night with a conservative group that opposed the planned removal of a statue of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. After listening to Mr. Trump on Tuesday, she said it was as if he had channeled her and her friends who had no interest in standing with Nazis or white supremacists. There's another simple test that we can employ to prove that the president was not referring to the neo-Nazis as fine people. It's so obvious it's painful to mention. The president's daughter and son-in-law are Orthodox Jews. His grandchildren are Jewish. And if that's still not enough to convince you, how about this? Does anyone believe that Donald Trump thinks there are good Antifa, the leftist thugs who are counter-protesting the neo-Nazi thugs? After all, if those two groups were the only ones involved and there were fine people on both sides, that means the president believed that there were fine Antifa people. Even MSNBC should have found that hard to swallow. Again, the very fine people on both sides President Trump described at the press conference were the people who wanted to remove the Robert E. Lee statue and the people who wanted to keep it. Both of these groups were nonviolent protesters, fine people with very different ideological views. The scandal of Charlottesville is not what President Trump said about neo-Nazis. It's what the media said President Trump said about neo-Nazis. It's a scandal because news reporting is supposed to be about gathering facts, not promoting an agenda. In Charlottesville, they got it exactly backwards. We have been living with the consequences ever since. Plainly put, ABC, CBS, NBC, NPR, The New York Times, 
The Washington Post and the others spread a malicious lie that has poisoned our national dialogue. They should apologize to the American people for what they have done. Don't hold your breath. Actually, I have a better idea. Let out a big sigh of relief because now you know the truth. I'm Steve Cortez, CNN political commentator and columnist for Real Clear Politics for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue. I've condemned neo-Nazis. I've condemned many different groups, but not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. You know, case after case of racial rhetoric coming out of the White House, and then when you have an actual incident of white nationalist terrorism like the killing in Charlottesville, uh, related to people saying Jews will not replace us, and the president saying you got very fine people there, of course this is part of a climate where people who are in the grip of this hateful extremist ideology feel validated, and they feel validated from all the way at the top, and that is part of our problem. He refuses to take responsibility for anything, even when he's wrong, even when he's proven wrong, refuses to take responsibility. It's incredible. And the fact that he held this press conference and continuously made excuses for the white supremacists, I mean, it, it just further reinforces what we already knew. The only thing I'm doubting right now is whether you're still going to be president by Friday. <laughs> because. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? You know, one side hates minorities, the other side hates people who hate minorities. Okay, two sides, all right? It's just like D-Day, remember, D-Day, two sides, allies and the Nazis. There was a lot of violence on both sides, okay? <laughs> Ruined a beautiful beach. Politicians lie. We all know that. This is not an indictment of all politicians, it's simply part of the game. It's our job as informed citizens to figure out the truth. And that's where journalists and the media come in. They are supposed to help us ferret out fact from fiction. So when they get a fact wrong, that's bad. When they get a fact wrong, know it's wrong, and don't correct it, that's worse. That's not getting a fact wrong, that's a lie. And that's journalistic malfeasance. The best, or maybe worst, example of this followed a presidential press conference at Trump Tower on Tuesday, August 15th, 2017. You remember what happened that previous weekend. A group of white supremacists held a white pride rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. The ostensible reason was to protest the removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. An Antifa group showed up to counter protest. The mayor and the police were totally unprepared to deal with the violence that ensued. Tragically, a young woman, Heather Heyer, was run over and killed by a neo-Nazi. The press conference itself was raucous. The media was antagonistic. The president was combative. Out of it all, one phrase eclipsed the thousands of words exchanged. The media reported that President Trump described neo-Nazis as very fine people. Only he didn't. In fact, he didn't even hint at it. Just the opposite. He condemned the neo-Nazis in no uncertain terms. So then, who were the fine people he mentioned? The answer? He was referring to another group of Charlottesville demonstrators who came out that weekend. Protesters who wanted the Robert E. Lee statue removed and protesters who wanted to keep the statue and restore the park's original name. This is what President Trump said about those peaceful protesters. You also had some very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, 
a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. A few moments later, in case there would be any misunderstanding, he makes his meaning even more explicit. I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists. They should be condemned totally. Lest you have any doubts that good people were in Charlottesville to protest the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue, the New York Times confirmed it in a story they published the next day, August 16th. Good people can go to Charlottesville, said Michelle Percy, a night shift worker at a Wichita, Kansas retirement home who drove all night with a conservative group that opposed the planned removal of a statue of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. After listening to Mr. Trump on Tuesday, she said it was as if he had channeled her and her friends who had no interest in standing with Nazis or white supremacists. There's another simple test that we can employ to prove that the president was not referring to the neo-Nazis as fine people. It's so obvious it's painful to mention. The president's daughter and son-in-law are Orthodox Jews. His grandchildren are Jewish. And if that's still not enough to convince you, how about this? Does anyone believe that Donald Trump thinks there are good Antifa, the leftist thugs who are counter-protesting the neo-Nazi thugs? After all, if those two groups were the only ones involved and there were fine people on both sides, that means the president believed that there were fine Antifa people. Even MSNBC should have found that hard to swallow. Again, the very fine people on both sides President Trump described at the press conference were the people who wanted to remove the Robert E. Lee statue and the people who wanted to keep it. Both of these groups were nonviolent protesters, fine people with very different ideological views. The scandal of Charlottesville is not what President Trump said about neo-Nazis. It's what the media said President Trump said about neo-Nazis. It's a scandal because news reporting is supposed to be about gathering facts, not promoting an agenda. In Charlottesville, they got it exactly backwards. We have been living with the consequences ever since. Plainly put, ABC, CBS, NBC, NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and the others spread a malicious lie that has poisoned our national dialogue. They should apologize to the American people for what they have done. Don't hold your breath. Actually, I have a better idea. Let out a big sigh of relief, because now you know the truth. I'm Steve Cortez, CNN political commentator and columnist for Real Clear Politics for Prager University. I didn't wait long. What, why did I didn't wait long. Like I didn't wait long. I wanted to make sure, unlike most politicians, that what I said was correct, not make a quick statement. The statement I made on Saturday, the first statement, was a fine statement. But you don't make statements that direct unless you know the fact. It takes a little while to get the facts. You still don't know the facts. And it's a very, very uh, important process to me. And it's a very important statement. So I don't want to go quickly and just make a statement for the sake of making a political statement. I want to know the facts. If you go back to my, in fact, I brought it. I brought it. I brought it. As I said on, remember this, Saturday, we condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence, it has no place in America. And then I went on from there. Now, here's the thing as to, excuse me, excuse me, take it nice and easy. Here's the thing. When I make a statement, I like to be correct. I want the facts. This event just happened. In fact, a lot of the event didn't even happen yet as we were speaking. This event just happened. Before I make a statement, I need the facts. So I don't want to rush into a statement. So making the statement when I made it was excellent. In fact, the young woman who I hear is a fantastic young woman, and it was on NBC, her mother wrote me and said through, I guess, Twitter, social media, 
the nicest things, and I very much appreciated that. I hear she was a fine, really, actually, an incredible young woman. But her mother on Twitter thanked me for what I said. But, but and honestly, now, if the press were not fake, and if it was honest, the press would have said what I said was very nice. But unlike you, and unlike, excuse me, unlike you and unlike the media, before I make a statement, I like to know the facts. They don't. They don't. They don't. How about, how about a couple of, how about a couple of infrastructure Was that terrorism? Say it, what? Not at all. I think uh, the country, look, you take a look. Uh, I've created over a million jobs since I'm president. The country is booming. The stock market is setting records. We have the highest employment numbers we've ever had in the history of our country. We're doing record business. We have the highest levels of enthusiasm. So the head of Walmart, who I know, who's a very nice guy, was making a political statement. I mean, Ask him how he's doing. I do it the same way, and you know why? Because I want to make sure, when I make a statement, that the statement is correct. And there was no way, there was no way of making a correct statement that early. I had to see the facts, unlike a lot of reporters. Unlike a lot of reporters, I didn't know David Duke was there. I wanted to see the facts. And the facts, as they started coming out, were very well stated. In fact, everybody said his statement was beautiful. If he would have made it sooner, that would have been good. I couldn't have made it sooner because I didn't know all of the facts. Frankly, people still don't know all of the facts. It was very important. Excuse me. Excuse me. It was very important to me to get the facts out and correctly. Because if I would have made a fast statement, and the first statement was made without knowing much other than what we were seeing. The second statement was made after, with knowledge, with great knowledge. There's still things, excuse me, there's still things that people don't know. I want to make a statement with knowledge. I wanted to know the facts. Okay. Was this two questions. Was this terrorism? And can you tell us how you're feeling about your chief strategist? Well, I think the driver of the car is a disgrace to himself, his family, and this country. And that is, you can call it terrorism. You can call it murder. You can call it whatever you want. I would just call it as the fastest one to come up with a good verdict. That's what I'd call it. Because there is a question. Is it murder? Is it terrorism? And then you get into legal semantics. The driver of the car is a murderer. And what he did was a horrible, horrible, inexcusable thing. Can you tell us how you're feeling about your chief strategist, Mr. Bannon? Can you Go talk ahead. about that? I, I would echo Maggie's question. Uh, Steve I never spoke to Mr. Bannon about it. Can you tell us broadly what your do you have still have confidence? Well, in we'll Steve? see. And look, look. I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. But Mr. Bannon came on very late. You know that. I went through 17 senators, governors, and I won all the primaries. Mr. Bannon came on very much later than that, uh, and I like him. He's a good man. Uh, he is not a racist. I can tell you that. He's a good person. He actually gets a very unfair press in that regard. He's a good person, and I think the press treats him, frankly, very unfairly. Do you have confidence that Adam McKean has called on you to defend your national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, against I've the Hamas attacks? It. I did it the last time. And he called on it again, linking the Senator team McCain? to the old Right, Senator saying, McCain, you mean the one yes. who voted against uh, Obamacare? And he said, "Who that is he, Senator? You mean Senator McCain, who voted against Senator, us getting good health care?" McCain yeah. said that the alt right is behind these attacks, and he linked that same group to those who perpetrated the attack in Charlottesville. Well, I, I don't know. I can't tell you. I'm sure Senator McCain must know what he's talking about. Uh, but when you say the alt right. Uh, define alt right to me. You define it. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying, no, Senator, define it for me. Come on, let's go. Define Senator it McCain defined them as the same group. Okay, what about the alt left that came McCain. charging? At, excuse me. What about the alt left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? This is Senator Senator McCain. What, let, let me ask you this. What about the fact they came charging, that they came charging with clubs in their hands, swinging clubs? Do they have any problem? I think they do. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that was a horrible, horrible day 
Wait a minute. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, fake news. That was a horrible day. I will tell you something. I watched those very closely, much more closely than you people watched it. And you have uh, — you, you had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And nobody wants to say that, but I'll say it right now. You had a group — you had a group on the other side that came charging in without a permit, and they were very, very violent. Go ahead. Sir, do you think that the, what you call the alt-left is the same as neo-Nazis? Oh, those people — all of those people — excuse me. I've condemned neo-Nazis. I've condemned many different groups. But not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue, Robert E. Lee. So, excuse me, and you take a look at some of the groups and you see, and you know it if you were honest reporters, which in many cases you're not, but many of those people were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So, this week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? But they were there to protest. Excuse me. You take a look the night before. They were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. Infrastructure question. Go ahead. Should statues of Robert E. Lee stay up? I would say that's up to a local town, community, or the federal government, depending on where it is located. Are you against the Confederacy? How concerned are you about race relations in America? And do you think things have gotten worse or better since you took office? I think they've gotten better or the same. I look, they've been frayed for a long time. And you can ask President Obama about that because he'd make speeches about it. But I believe that the fact that I brought in, it will be soon, millions of jobs. You see where companies are moving back into our country. I think that's going to have a tremendous positive impact on race relations. We have companies coming back into our country. We have two car companies that just announced. We have Foxconn in Wisconsin just announced. We have many companies, I say pouring back into the country. I think that's going to have a huge positive impact on race relations. You know why? It's jobs. What people want now, they want jobs. They want great jobs with good pay. And when they have that, you watch how race relations will be. And I'll tell you, we're spending a lot of money on the inner cities. We're going to fix — we're fixing the inner cities. We're doing far more than anybody's done with respect to the inner cities. It's a priority for me. And it's very important. Are you, are, you, are you putting what you're calling the alt-left and white supremacists on the same moral plane? I'm not putting anybody on a moral plane. What I'm saying is this. You had a group on one side and you had a group on the other, and they came at each other with clubs, and it was vicious, and it was horrible, and it was a horrible thing to watch. But there is another side. There was a group on this side — you can call them the left, you've just called them the left — that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, on both sides, sir, you said there was hatred, there was violence on both sides. Uh, are well, I do think there's the blame. Speech. Yes, I think there's blame on both sides. You look at you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. And you don't have any doubt about it either. And, only and, 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 and if you reported it accurately, you would say. Not Kill the person. This. They Ever showed up in Charlottesville. They, start, they showed up in Charlottesville. Excuse me. To protest. Excuse me. They didn't put themselves down as you. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group. Excuse me. Excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Well, no, George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down — excuse me — are we going to take down — are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him? Okay, good. Are we going to take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. Now, are we going to take down his statue? 
So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history. You're changing culture. And you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Now, in the other group also, you had some fine people, but you also had troublemakers, and you see them come with the, with the black outfits and with the helmets and with the baseball bats. You got a, you had a lot of bad you had a lot of bad people in the other group too. You unfairly, sir. I'm sorry. I just didn't understand what you were saying. You were saying the press has treated white nationalists unfairly. No. I just didn't understand what you were saying. No. There were people in that rally, and I looked the night before. If you look, they were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. I'm sure in that group there were some bad ones. The following day, it looked like they had some rough, bad people neo-Nazis, uh, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them. But you had a lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally protest because, you know, I don't know if you know, they had a permit. The other group didn't have a permit. So I only tell you this. There are two sides to a story. I thought what took place was a horrible moment for our country, a horrible moment. But there are two sides to the country. Does anybody have a final? Does anybody have you have an infrastructure? What makes you think you can get an infrastructure bill? You didn't get health care. Well, didn't you know, I'll tell you, more. we came very close with health care. Unfortunately, John McCain decided to vote against it at the last minute. You'll have to ask John McCain why he did that. But we came very close to health care. We will end up getting health care, uh, but we'll get the infrastructure. And actually, infrastructure is something that I think we'll have bipartisan support on. I actually think I, I actually think Democrats will go along with the infrastructure. Mr. President, have you spoken to the family? Have you spoken to the family of the victim of the car attack? No, I'll be reaching out. I'll be reaching out. When will you be reaching out? I was very. I, I thought that the statement put out, uh, the the mother's statement, I thought was a beautiful statement. I was telling you, it was it was something that. I really appreciate it. I thought it was terrific and really under the under the kind of uh, stress that she's under and the heartache that she's under, I thought putting out that statement to me was really something I won't forget. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you plan to go to Charlottesville, Mr. President? Will you go to I own a house in Charlottesville. Will you go to Does anyone know I own a house in Charlottesville? Where is it? Oh boy. It's gonna be it's in Charlottesville, you'll see. Is it near Where is the winery or something? It's a, it is the winery. Well, will you go to visit what you to visit to try to I mean, I know a lot about Charlottesville. Charlottesville is a great place that's been very badly hurt over the last couple of days. Well, but I own, I own actually one of the largest wineries in the United States. It's in Charlottesville. What do you think needs to be done to overturn the Supreme Court? Well, I really think jobs can have a big impact. I think if we continue to create jobs, over a million, substantially more than a million, and you see just the other day the car companies coming in with Fox, you know, Fox. I think if we continue to create jobs at levels that I'm, that I'm creating jobs, I think that's going to have a tremendous impact, positive impact on race relations. And, and what, what, and what you said today, how do you think that will impact the racial? Because the people are going to be working, they're going to be making a lot of money, much more money than they ever thought but possible. I mean, your remarks and that's going to happen. And the other thing, very important, I believe wages will start going up. They haven't gone up for a long time. I believe wages now because the economy is doing so well with respect to employment and unemployment, I believe wages will start to go up. I think that'll have a tremendously positive impact on race relations. Why have figures been drawn to you, Mr.
Welcome back to the lead, the national lead now. By most accounts, almost all of the people protesting against the hateful bigots, the Nazis and Klansmen in Charlottesville, were peaceful. But not all of them. In their midst was a sometimes very violent group of protesters that call themselves Antifa, known to not only clash with bigots, but also sometimes with police and occasionally storefronts. At least two journalists in Virginia were assaulted by violent counter-protesters over the weekend, including this cameraman from the Richmond CBS affiliate. CNN's Sarah Gannon now takes us inside Antifa and shows us this group like you've never seen it before. It's 6 a.m. in Portland, Oregon, and we're headed to a bar with blacked out windows. They wanted to meet us really early in the morning because they're concerned about a lot of people being around. We are meeting members of the Rose City Antifa, short for anti-fascist. This group's main goal is to disrupt neo-Nazis and white supremacists, but also take on government and capitalism. Antifa is any group that's willing to stand up against fascists by any means necessary. By any means necessary, they say, can mean outing a white nationalist at their work or to their neighbors. Or, as we've seen recently, violence, fires, property damage, hand-to-hand -hand combat at protests across the country. Explain to me the reasoning behind fighting. You have to make it so unpalatable to be doing white supremacist organizing that they no longer want to do that. And historically, that's what's worked. You have to put your body in the way and you have to make it speak in a language that they understand and sometimes that is violence. There's no firm number on how many Antifa activists there are in the U.S. because there isn't any one organization. Most are local groups that recruit and communicate through social media. But experts who track these organizations say their membership is growing in response to the rise of white national groups and the election of President Donald Trump. <laughs> Violence and property destruction led to more than 200 arrests in Washington, D.C. on Inauguration Day. Prosecutors say they were wearing masks covered head to toe in black, a tactic the Antifa called Black Bloc. People dress in Black Bloc for a few things. One, Scott Crow has been leading anarchist and militant leftist groups for decades. So people put on the masks so that we can all become anonymous. And then therefore we are able to move more freely and do what we need to do, whether it is illegal or not. So some people will push back on that and say that the Black Bloc is to keep people from being identified and arrested when they break the law, when they commit crime. Damn right. It's a good way to avoid uh, the ramifications of law enforcement. We saw that firsthand at a May Day protest in New York City. We cover our face because the Nazis will try to find out who we are. And that is a very bad thing because they harass people. When they organize, they kill people, they hurt people, they fight people. And we're the ones who are fighting back. They are the second coming of Hitler. Police in Berkeley told us they haven't seen this kind of destruction since the 1960s. Law enforcement in other cities are dealing with similar situations. Like in Portland, Oregon, where Antifa have been involved in at least 10 protests ending in violence, according to police. And it's wearing on the community. It is new. It's like this rumble mentality of, I'm going to bring my friends, you bring your friends, and we're going to fight it out in the park. It's not something we've seen here. It's not good for the city. People are, are just frustrated by it. It's affecting their livability. It's affecting their business. Has it become more violent? It, it happens quicker. The fire starting uh, that we saw on May Day is something we haven't really seen much of in the past. The running through the street, breaking windows, and, and everything in sight. We haven't seen it as consistently as we've seen it in the last eight months. But it's the violence that's gotten them attention, directly confronting groups that preach white nationalist rhetoric, like on Inauguration Day when white nationalist Richard Spencer was punched in the face. And it was the Antifa movement that caused Berkeley to cancel speeches by extreme right provocateurs like Milo Yiannopoulos. If there are the more hardcore elements, the white supremacists and neo-Nazis that go to these rallies that are itching for a fight, we're there to say, we'll stand in your way. The thing is, Jake, that experts who I've talked to say that the Antifa violence may end up actually 
hurting their cause. Across the country, people who are dressing in black bloc are getting arrested. Authorities are taking this seriously, but that's not stopping them at all. They have been telling me that they believe that this tactic is working. Now, one of the interesting things that I found in doing this reporting, what's really surprised me, is that we found that a lot of these new Antifa members, they're young people, disenfranchised young people who felt that they were let down by both parties after the election, and this is where they ended up. Jake?